This section of the book is on change of coordinates. It's a topic that uh, frequently gets kind of omitted, or at least it's not done as a separate section. It's just mentioned lots, in lots of little places. It really, uh, really works out better, though, if you go ahead and, and uh, devote an entire section to it and think of it as a topic in and of itself. It is fundamentally, fundamentally important. A change of coordinates is really the mathematically precise way of describing when you've got a given situation and one person wants to describe it using these variables and uh, another person wants to describe the same situation or same mathematical problem but using different variables. Change of coordinates is the mathematically precise way in which uh, they can compare those two things in which they can say, ah, I can take your calculations and change them into mine, or you can take my calculations and change them into yours. So um, it's a, in some problems, the, the, when you change coordinates, you end up with a, a much simpler looking problem. Sometimes it's, these coordinates are just as bad as these, or just as good as these, but sometimes there's a really simplifying change of coordinates, which is also a nice thing. And we're going to use changes of coordinates uh, throughout the rest of the book in different contexts. Um, so there's one really easy change of coordinates um, that you are probably so familiar with that I'm not sure I should talk about it because it may just confuse you more. But it's, suppose, suppose you've got a physical problem um, and one person, there are two quantities that you're measuring and one person measures, is letting X denote the number of grams of something involved in your situation and why some distance that's measured in meters in the problem. So this is one person is using x to denote the number of grams involved and y to denote some measurement of meters. But suppose there's a, a second person who decides that those aren't convenient unit, units and uh, another person decides, oh, I'd rather measure things in kilograms, and so I'll use x hat, just as some mild variation of x, x hat kilograms. And instead of measuring in meters, this person decides that it's better to measure in centimeters. Well, I mean, clearly these two people can go back and forth in you know, whatever whatever this person measures in terms of grams and meters can be converted into what this person measures in terms of kilograms and centimeters. And you can take measurements over here and go back here, any calculations over here, and go back here. Um, you know, as, as a specific example, suppose x hat equals 1 and y hat equals 2, then what? Well, that means that x hat mean, equaling 1 means you've got 1 kilogram. But in the variable x, x is me measuring the number of grams. Well, 1 kilogram is 1,000 grams. So this means x would be 1,000. And y hat being 2 means 2 centimeters, so 2 hundredths of a meter. So if y is the number of meters, y should be 2 hundredths, so 0 0.02. Um, more generally, regardless of what x and y are, that you can write the formulas for going back and forth. x is always 1,000 times x hat, and y is always y hat divided by 100. So this is, if you've got x hat and y hat, how you change to x and y, but you could solve for x hat and y hat and say, oh, instead I could write, say, x hat is x over 1,000, and y hat is 100y. Um, this kind of this kind of change of coordinates, this is a change of coordinates, this is a very simple, so this is a simple change of coordinates.
And it's usually referred to as a scaling. Or just scale. Um, and more, you know, if you want a general, what's what in general is scaling? Well, if you have a whole bunch of x hat variables and x variables, then so if you've got so suppose you've got x one hat through x n hat, and you've got x one through x n, and you want to say that these are obtained from these by scaling, it just means that for each i, x i hat is some non-zero constant times x i. Um, Right, and it doesn't even matter which side the AI goes on because you could divide both sides by AI since AI is not zero. And then XI would be a non-zero constant times XI hat. So you can go back and forth. Um, you may be wondering, okay, you've said kind of a scaling is a change of coordinates and you get it by multiplying each coordinate by a non you get one by multiplying each coordinate by a non-zero scalar, but what is it that is the change of coordinates? So um, the change of coordinates itself is the function. So in that example, in the scaling example, where you have xi hat is ai times xi, the change of coordinates is actually a function. This is really from, I'm going to go from the x's to the x hats. Um, is the function. I'll denote it by a capital B. B, and it would be from Rn to Rn, given by, well, it's just, I'm making this sound complicated, but it's not. Given by the x hats, which are v's of the x's, and it's just, you have a1 times x1, plus, uh, comma, a2 times x2, and times x where the ai's are. Right, so this is what you, you mean, the, the change of coordinates that takes you from the x variables to the x hat variables is this function from Rn to Rn. And the point of the AI is being not zero for a scaling, the change of coordinates. For, for, this is, I'm just talking about for scaling right now, the change of coordinates in general. <laughs> it's, it's more general than this. The, um, the point of the AI is being non-zero is that you can solve for the x hat. So uh, it's a big deal that if you want the change of coordinates from x hat to x, it's just the inverse function, the function that undoes this one. x hat, which is the inverse function of, uh, sorry, uh, x is the inverse function of phi done to x hat, and it would be exactly you would take the reciprocal of a1 times x1 hat and keep taking reciprocals and putting in hats. So this is making something really easy, like scaling, look complicated. But we're trying to lead into more complicated change of coordinates. So a scaling change of coordinates, so scaling is just you multiply each coordinate by some non-zero scalar, some non-zero constant. But the point is that it, you can undo it, that there's an inverse function which obtained by just dividing by the constants. Um, 
this is important because this is the kind of thing we want from a change of coordinates in general. So let's look at another um, example before I make the general definition. So let's look at a slightly more complicated example, not a lot more complicated, but slightly. Let's look at, and now I won't use hats, I'll use let just because the functions look significantly different. Okay, I'm kind of scaling the x-coordinate, so let u equal 2x and v equal x plus y. So the question is, is this something we want to call a change of coordinates? Oh, instead of using x's and y's, use u's and v's. So what, what function am I talking about? I'm talking about the function phi. Yeah, you don't have to call it phi, but I'm going to keep picking on phi today. Phi of x and y. That's 2x, x plus y. Um, if, if you think about the scaling example, you should be asking, well, we want to be able to undo it. Why do you want to be able to undo a, a change of coordinates? Because if you're looking at some problem and somebody is using x's and y's, you want to be able to translate whatever they've said about, in terms of x and y into a statement about u's and v's. But you also want to be able to go the other way. If somebody tells you something about u's and v's, you want to be able to figure out what that means in terms of x and y. That means given u and v, you ought to be able to produce the unique x, y. That means you need to be able to undo this function. So phi needs to be invertible. It needs to have an inverse function. Um, but it does. You can solve for u and v. Uh, let's try that again. You can solve for x and y in terms of u and v. Uh, you can just solve this quickly. This is x equals u over 2. And you, then you can solve this. This is, we're trying to solve for y. So this is y equals v minus x, but x is u over 2. So we get y is v minus u over 2. So if you're given x and y and you want u and v, you use this. But if you're given u and v and you want the corresponding x and y, It is that your x-coordinate is u over 2, and your y-coordinate is v minus u over 2. So um, the existence of this inverse function, the function that undoes this function, means that this function phi is what's known as a one-to-one -one correspondence. You should have heard that term before. One-to-one -one correspondence, a big technical term if you want to sound like you know a lot of mathematics. It's a bijection. And one to one and one to is exactly what you need for there to be an inverse function. Um, so that there's one and only one thing. If you, if you give an x and a y, it specifies one and only one uv pair. And if you're given a uv pair, it specifies one and only one xy. Um, OK. Is that all we want from a change of coordinates, that there's a bijection, that it's defined by a bijection, and the change of coordinates the other way is defined by its inverse? Not really, or def well, I shouldn't say not really, definitely not. Uh, we want more in a calculus course. The, being a, having a bijection just kind of means there's this one-to-one -one correspondence, and it just, in a way, it just means there are the same number of things on each side. It, it doesn't. It doesn't really tell us that some properties that we want to calculate in terms of the x and y's, we could just as easily calculate in terms of the u's and v's. We want more. In particular, we're, we're in a calculus course, and we want to take derivatives. And what we'd like to know is that if we take derivatives in terms of x and y, that's equivalent to taking derivatives in terms of u and v. 
And what do I mean by equivalent? I mean, someone gives you the derivatives in terms of u and v. You can translate that information into the information about the derivatives in terms of x and y and vice versa. Um, so what does that mean we want? We want more. We, we certainly want a bijection. We want a one-to-one -one correspondence from the change of coordinates. But we also want our bijection. We want phi to preserve derivative properties. Um, transfer derivative calculations from one coordinate system to another. So, in particular, suppose you had some function f. Suppose you have an f. And f is a function on, well, let me just stick with x and y for a minute. Suppose you have f, and it's a function of x and y. We would like to know that if we calculate the partial derivatives of f, assume f is differentiable, if we calculate the partial derivatives of f, that, oh, if we look at the u and v coordinates, so the particular u and v that we were just looking at, that we could calculate the partial derivatives in terms of u and v, knowing the partial derivatives in terms of x and y. And in fact, knowing that f is differentiable as a function of x and y, we'd like to know that f is differentiable as a function of u and v, and vice versa. So suppose you have this. Um, we'd like that a minimum thing we'd like um, so I'll suppose you've got as we do that uh, uv is phi of x, y. And what we're trying to do, and we know phi is, we're uh, that we have a particular phi, and we know it's a bijection. We're trying to see what other property it needs to have for us to want to call it a change of coordinates. What we'd like to know, so then xy is phi inverse of uv. What we'd like to know is, oh, f is differentiable as a function of x and y. and only if it's differentiable as a function of u and v. But as a function of u and v exactly means when you compose with phi inverse, that's the technical meaning. So this is, you can leave out, we'd like to know that f is differentiable. You can leave out as a function of x and y, f is what it is. That's a, how we talk when we're trying to do compositions just by using variable names, but um, f is differentiable if and only if f, if and only if it's not f is differentiable, but f composed with phi inverse. This is what it technically means to say that f is differentiable as a function of x and y if and only if it's differentiable as a function of u and v. It means f is differentiable if and only if this is differentiable. But <clears throat> that means that, well, 
for f differentiable to imply this is differentiable, we'd like, the chain rule would tell us if we required phi inverse to be differentiable, that would be enough. Because composition, the chain rule tells us the composition of differentiable functions is differentiable. So, yeah, if we require phi inverse to be differentiable, then f being differentiable would imply f composed with phi inverse is differentiable. On the other hand, f composed with phi inverse being differentiable would tell us that f is differentiable by the chain rule if we knew that phi itself were differentiable because we could f, this looks silly, but f is, you compose, take f, you compose with phi inverse, and then you compose with phi. Well, phi inverse composed with phi is just the identity function. And then, so this is all just f again. But it means that if you know this is differentiable, f composed with phi inverse, and you know phi is differentiable, then the chain rule tells you f is differentiable. So <clears throat> if we want to be able to say that a function is differentiable with respect to one set of variables, if and only if it's differentiable with respect to the other set of variables, what that means is we need for our change of coordinates to be differentiable and, have it, and for its inverse to be differentiable. So um, back over here, is this a reasonable change of coordinates? The answer is yes. And it's not just because it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. We certainly want phi, what we're calling a change of coordinates, to have an inverse function. But what's, in addition to that, what we need is that um, I'll just say phi we want phi and phi inverse to be all right differentiable and then there's a the question of how diff how many times we want it to be differentiable I've defined the notion of continuously differentiable. It means that all the partial derivatives exist and are continuous, or that's a, certainly a characterization of it. Um, we'd like that. We'd like continuously differentiable so that, um, so that continuity properties of the derivatives are preserved when we do a change of coordinates. Continuously differentiable. Another term for continuously differentiable is, and this was mentioned in an earlier section, i.e. of class C1. C1 means continuously differentiable one time. So we want phi and phi inverse to be C1. There's another thing that most people want from a change of coordinates. Um, stronger. It, it depends on how much you want. If you just want first derivatives, so partial derivatives in terms of x to correspond to partial derivatives in terms of, or in terms of x and y to correspond to partial derivatives in terms of u and v, fine. C1 is fine. Continuously differentiable one time. But suppose you want to look at second derivatives or third, deri third partial derivatives or fourth partial derivatives or partial derivatives of any order at all and you always want to be able to go back and forth between x and y and u and v, then you want more than c1. You need to be able to differentiate an infinite number of times. So, um, so we want this or um, to be smooth. And smooth, this is usually called C infinity. And smooth for a function, you're probably just used to smooth for geometric objects like graphs. Smooth for a function means infinitely differentiable. So all the partial derivatives of any order are continuous, uh, exist and are continuous. Of course, they, um, yeah, I don't want to say any more than that. All the partial derivatives of all orders exist and are continuous. And Throughout this course, uh, throughout this textbook, we're typically going to uh, use smooth changes of coordinates. So a smooth change of coordinates, let me go ahead and define it. So the definition. The definition. 
position. B. From iron to iron. So we don't care how many dimensions we're in. This example that we are going to come back to, look at in more depth, is just from R2 to R2. Is a smooth change of coordinates. If and only that. bijection, so a one-to-one -one correspondence, so which means it has an inverse function, and B and B inverse are smooth. And one more time, I'll write IE C infinity. Each of them, each component function of each of them um, has continuous partial derivatives of all orders. So, um, all right. So, <laughs> that's what we want out of, out of a change of coordinates. It's one-to-one -one correspondence that lets you transfer or lets you do all kind of derivative calculations of all orders in one set of coordinates and transfer that back to the other coordinates, translate that into the other coordinates if you so desire. So let's look at, um, let's look at the change of coordinates that I've got on the board. First of all, I should say this, I probably have said already, this is a change of coordinates. Certainly each of these component functions is for phi and for phi inverse is infinitely differentiable. They're just um, <clears throat> linear functions. So this is a change of coordinates. In fact, this is called a linear change of coordinates because all the functions are linear. Um, so this is a linear. But for us, what we really care about right now, smooth change of coordinates. So let's see how this lets you take derivative calculations in terms of x and turn them into derivative calculations in terms of u and v and vice versa. Um, it's the chain rule over and over again. So you can, you can write the chain rule in its total derivative form. This uh, kind of disguises how you calculate, but if you have a, so suppose you have, so suppose we have a function um, f of x, y. When we take f and we compose with phi inverse, then, so f composed with phi inverse, um, is something that you would stick u and v in. Now, you can figure out what this is. Um, right? This is um, phi in, if you were given a function f, you could, you can just use our formula, phi inverse of uv is u over 2, v minus u over 2. And we will do that in a minute with a particular function. But what we'd like to see is what the chain rule tells you you get in terms of derivatives just for a general f. And what the chain rule tells you is that, oh, the total derivative of f composed with phi inverse is you take d, the total derivative at phi inverse of p of f and compose that with the derivative at the total derivative of the inverse at p. 
Um, okay. Well, it may be a little hard to see what that's telling you. So let's do, let's not look at it in terms of total derivatives. It is the elegant way to see things. But let's look at the partial derivatives and see what happens. We can now think of f as either a function, of, if we have an f, we can think of f as a function of x and y or a function of u and v. Thinking of it as a function of u and v means precisely that you are composing with v inverse. Um, so, but we don't have to worry too much. Suppose you want to calculate the partial derivative of f with respect to x. What does the chain rule say? Well, now you think of f as a, as a function of u and v, and u and v are functions of x and y. Um, well, if f is a function of u and v, the chain rule says, oh, you take the partial derivative with respect to u times the partial derivative of u with respect to x, and you add to that the partial derivative of f with respect to v times the partial derivative of v with respect to x. And if you want the partial derivative of f with respect to y, then once again, thinking of, oh, f is really a function of u and v, but u and v are functions of x and y, you would calculate the partial derivative of f with respect to v. That's the partial derivative of v with respect of, I don't know what just happened, u. That's the partial derivative of u with respect to y, plus the partial derivative of f with respect to v as the partial derivative of v with respect to y. Right? That's the chain rule, where we're now thinking kind of, oh, f started out as a function of u and v, and we wrote u and v in terms of x and y. Or you can write instead that, oh, uh, what's the partial derivative of f in terms of u? Well, now you think of f as originally being a function of x and y, and x and y are functions of u and v. So then the chain rule would say, oh, this is the partial derivative of f with respect to x times the partial derivative of x with respect to u plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times the partial derivative of y with respect to u. And the partial derivative of f with respect to v would be the partial derivative of f with respect to x times the partial derivative of x with respect to v plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times the partial derivative of y with respect to v. Um, both of these sets of equations are correct. It's just a question of whether you want to start with the information about the partial derivatives in terms of x and y and go to u's and v's, or start with information about the partial derivatives of f in terms of u and v and go to information about partial derivatives in terms of x and y. So let's, let's pick an example, a, a particular f, and do this. So we've got what we're using for our coordinate change. So we've got just x is, oh, let's, let's go, u is 2x. V is x plus y, or writing x and y in terms of u and v, that's x is u over 2, and y is v minus u over 2. All right. So let's pick some particular f. I want f of x, y, so let's say f of x, y, so let f of x, y be 4 minus x minus 1 squared minus y plus 1 squared. All right, let's look at that. Okay. Um, suppose you graph this. You really should know what the graph of this is. Um, 
it's a, a circular paraboloid, it shifted over. If we had 4 minus x squared minus y squared, maybe that would look more usual to you, but I've moved the hump over. This curves downward to where it occurs when x is 1 and y is minus 1. So x is 1, we'll I'll draw that here. So this is x, y, z. Um, x is 1, uh, y is minus 1. And so, in perspective, 1 minus 1 is there, and that's where the hump should be. I'm not going to try to draw this too well. But the peak, this, should occur roughly there. All right. Okay. So, um, it's a circular paraboloid that curves downward and it's, it retains its global maximum at 1 minus 1. Okay, so what? Well, let's look at what happens if you, what if you wanted to graph this in terms of u and v? Right? If you can move things around, u and v, and here's z. Now, what you can do is you can just replace x and y by what they are in terms of u and v and figure out what happens. But let's use some derivative stuff. Let's, let's look at partial derivatives. So for instance, this point where the peak occurs, where the maximum occurs, is where the tangent plane is horizontal. We're going to talk about this more at length in a later section. But the tangent plane has to be horizontal, or what's the same thing, the gradient. This is where the partial derivative, so at the point, um, 1 minus 1, the partial derivative with respect to x is 0, and the partial derivative with respect to y is 0. And that's why you get horizontal tangent plane. Um, well, now, we don't really know that a change of coordinates will still give us a global maximum, but let's C, or will still give us a global maximum, or even a place where the gradient in terms of u and v are both zero. But let's look. The formulas we just had that I just erased, tell us that if you use a change of coordinates, places where partial derivatives, so the gradient was 0, go to places where the gradient is 0. Why? Because we had partial derivative of f with respect to u is the partial derivative of f with respect to x times the partial derivative of x with respect to u plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times the partial derivative of y with respect to u and the partial derivative of f with respect to v is the partial derivative of f with respect to x times the partial derivative of x with respect to v plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times the partial derivative of y with respect to v. So what? <laughs> so what is, if you're at a point where the partial derivative of f with respect to x and the partial derivative of f with respect to y are both zero, then this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, this is zero, and both of these are zero. So that, oh, um, if the gradient was 0 before, it will be 0 afterwards under a change of coordinates, um, which just means that if we want to know where that peak goes under the change of coordinates, um, we could just put it, or well, this would do it anyway. The peak was at, this peak was at xy equals 1 minus 1, where does 1 minus 1 go? That's uv is, uv is, um, when x is 1, you'd get u is 2, x is 1, y is minus 1, so v is 0, so it goes to 2, 0. 
So the, yeah, we have to have a horizontal tangent plane. If we graph, take our new graph in terms of u and v, we have to have a horizontal tangent plane at 2, 0. But maybe there are lots of places with horizontal tangent planes now. No, it's an if and only if because we had the other pair of equations that, oh yes, the partial derivative of f with respect to x is the partial of f with respect to u is the partial of u with respect to x plus the partial derivative of f with respect to v times the partial derivative of v with respect to x and the other equation, the partial of f with respect to y equals the partial of f with respect to u, partial u, partial y, plus the partial of f with respect to v, partial v, partial y. And what's the point? The point is that if you end up at a place where the partial derivatives with respect to u and v are both zero, the partial derivatives with respect to x and y had to be zero. So the, yeah, there's, since we started with one and only one place where the gradient vector was zero, um, you end up with a horizontal tangent plane. I guess I didn't verify that. Could. You end up with a place with one and only one place where the horizontal, where the tangent plane is horizontal. You can, you can put in what u and v, what x and y are in terms of u and v and have a computer graph this if you want, but really all that happens is qualitatively Things look very similar under this change of coordinates. Our, our peak has moved to 2, 0. So here's 2 and v is 0. But aside from that, it looks more or less like that, except it's stretched out along the, the u axis. So it peaks here again at 4, which I didn't draw before anyway. And it's more stretched out along the, the u axis. But qualitatively, it looks very similar to how it looked before. You expect to see a number of features that are the same under a change of coordinates. And what we've just verified is that places where you have horizontal tangent planes are preserved. You, know, you can go back and forth. There's a one-to-one -one correspondence by where the tangent plane is horizontal here and over there. Um, we, I didn't actually do the calculations, and, and we could. So, for instance, our f, I'll write it over here again for convenience, 4 minus x minus 1 squared minus y plus 1 squared. So the partial derivative of f with respect to x is minus x minus 1. Partial of x with respect to u is a half. And then you get plus the partial of f with respect to y, which is minus 2y plus 1. And then the partial of y with respect to u is minus a half. So you can calculate the partial derivative of f with respect to u. Using the chain rule, you can calculate the partial derivative of f with respect to v using the chain rule. So once again, you get the minus 2 times x minus 1 times the partial of x with respect to v, which is 0. So that part doesn't show up. Um, and then plus the partial of f with respect to y, which is still minus 2 times y plus 1. And the partial of y with respect to v, which is just 1. But suppose you're given this change of coordinates u is this and v is this, and you'd like to know the partial derivatives with respect to u and v without having to actually explicitly invert this, calc this, this function, the change of coordinates function. You don't want to explicitly solve for x in terms of y. Then could you still find the partial of f with respect to u and the partial of y with respect to v? Well, yeah, but you have to be more devious. You have to come down here. So let me do that and show you how to be devious. <laughs> so the way to be devious is to go, oh, OK, I know the partial of f with respect to x. It's minus 2 times x minus 1. The partial of f with respect to u, well, that's one of the things we're trying to figure out. 
partial of u with respect to x is 2. The partial of f with respect to v is one of the things we're trying to figure out. The partial of v with respect to x is 1. And then you set up the other equation. The partial of f with respect to y is minus 2 times y plus 1 equals, and then it's what we're trying to, one of the things we're trying to find, times the partial of u with respect to y. The partial of u with respect to y is 0 plus the partial of f with respect to v times, the, oh, this is bad. That should have been a v. <clears throat> and then the partial of v with respect to y, which is a 1. So then you've got two equations and the two unknowns you're trying to solve for, the partial of f with respect to u and the partial of f with respect to v, and you solve. <clears throat> the beauty of this is you never had to explicitly invert to find the inverse change of coordinates. Um, in fact, this one's really, this system of equations is really easy because there's a 0 right there. You just get the partial of f with respect to v is minus 2 times y plus 1, which is what we found up here. And then once you have that, you can put that in here and you get, you can solve for the partial of f with respect to u just by replacing that by minus 2 times y plus 1, putting it over there and dividing both sides of the equation by 2. Point is, you can calculate the partial derivatives with respect to u and v without ever explicitly inverting your change of coordinates. All right, I have a few, a couple of more little things to say. We're really going to look at changes of coordinates in lots of sections, later sections, and that's where we're going to do most of the stuff. This is just an introduction, but I do need to say, <coughs> <coughs> no, that wasn't what I needed to say. I need to say one other thing, and that's that you can't always expect a change of coordinates. I wrote a change of coordinates was a function from Rn to Rn. This is not, you don't need all of Rn. So, as an example, suppose we take, and I had a specific example I wanted, suppose we had u equals y plus e to the x minus 1, and d equals x cubed. Can we use this as a change of coordinates? And the answer is, well, yes and no. Um, so we got uv is some function of x and y, and it's given by y plus e to the x minus 1 comma x cubed. Fine. This is differentiable. Um, it's also a bijection. It's a one-to-one -one differentiable function. However, uh, in fact, it's smooth. It's infinitely differentiable. It's C infinity. This is smooth. But if you solve for x and y in terms of u and v, it says x is the cube root of v, so v to the one-third. And this says y is u minus e to the x plus 1, but x is v to the 1 third, so you get u minus e v to the 1 third plus 1. So there is an inverse function, u and v, and it is you get v to the 1 third, u minus e raised to the v to the 1 third plus 1, but this is not differentiable wherever v is 0. If v is 0, this is not differentiable. If v is 0. Well, that causes a problem any place that v is 0. This is not something that we want to use in a calculus course to go back and forth and and not mess up derivatives calculations. But it's perfectly fine any place else where v isn't 0. And v being 0 is exactly where um, x is 0. If, if v is 0, 
That's where x is 0. It's an if and only if. So we would be happy to use this as a smooth change of coordinates as long as x isn't 0, because x equals 0 is, gives us where v is 0 over here. Um, and that would be bad. But any place else, everything is fine. So this is what's known as a local change of coordinates. So it's not, uh, and when we're talking about local, the other option is global, it's not a global smooth change of coordinates. However, at any point P where so P equals some point A B where we don't want X to be zero. That's what's causing the problem. Um, at any point P where a is unequal to zero, phi is what's known as a local change of coordinates. What that means is it preserves all the properties, all the derivative properties that we care about, at least near p. So, Define this. So, definition. Um, suppose U and V, so now big script U and big script V, are open subsets of Rn. which we're thinking of as a change of coordinates, just from one open subset to the other, is a bijection, so a smooth bijection. So C infinity with a smooth inverse. is also smooth. then um, he is called a local change of coordinates. Doesn't have to be on all of our end. It can just be on an open set. And in fact, you say, <clears throat> P is some point in, then such a such a phi is called a local change of coordinates at P. Um, and it's local changes of coordinates that we'll typically worry about throughout the course. Uh, there's lots more to say about local changes of coordinates, um, but that, I'll save that for the more depth portion of this section.